thanks a lot for, for inviting me to be here. It, it's really nice. I spent the weekend here in Vienna also. I, I really like Vienna. This is not my first time here and I, I'm really happy to visit the city back. And today it was really great talking to, to everyone here. Every, many people that I follow the work quite closely for many years and it's great to speak to you. So, so yeah, so uh, the title of the talk has this weekly bound materials and competing energy scales. And I would like to start by actually telling you what I mean by that um, and, and ex give you a, a, a little bit of an example of that, if I can change the slide. Yeah. So, so I start by giving a practical example. This is the aspirin crystal. And it's a prototypical weekly bound <coughs> system, as I'll explain next. It's a molecular crystal. And um, what makes this weakly bound is that it's predominantly stabilized by what we call weak interactions. These are uh, hydrogen bonds interactions and, and, and Van der Waals interactions that spend some energy range from going from tens to hundreds of mill electron volts. These are not the only type of weakly bound system. You can have also interfaces of molecules with solid state systems that is also weakly bound system. And you see that next in my talk or interfaces between different Van der Waals materials that are stabilized predominantly by Van der Waals. Um, and what makes it interesting is that these uh, weak interactions, together with the atomic composition of these systems, they define the energy scale of nuclear motion in this system. So nuclear motion can be measured in many ways. One such way is, for example, by calculating a Raman uh, vibrational spectrum of these systems. This is a calculation that I'm showing there that I did in my group, where you can see this type of this Raman spectra in this crystal. They spend from very few to many thousands of wave numbers. And that spins the intermolecular uh, uh, motions to the intramolecular motions. If you translate that to energy scales, it gives a few to, to many hundreds of, of mill electron volts. Now, what makes these energy scales interesting in this type of systems is that they are coupled. And because they are coupled, the external agents such as temperature or pressure, or even just taking into account that nuclei are not classical particles, but quantum changes the types of nuclear motion that happen there, and you can also see that in simulations. So the black line that I show on top is a type of simulation where I switch off all of these couplings between all the, the degrees of freedom. That's a harmonic approximation, yeah? But I can also do simulations based on molecular dynamics in which all of these couplings are in, and this is what I show there in, in red in this, in this uh, panel that you see there. And you see that such an important peak, such as the OH stretch that I show here, disappears yeah, when I take this coupling and the harmonicity into account. You can also look at, look at this a bit closer and you can look at this type of correlation plots uh, where you, you look at correlations between the intensity of the different peaks in the low energy range and signals in the off diagonal means that there is correlation in this intensity changes over time, which is a signature of coupling. And at this point, you might think, okay, I mean, but electrons don't play an active role here because these are small energy scales for, for electrons. Um, but actually, it's also very important in these systems because there is strong electron phonon coupling. Yeah? And so what that means is that um, when you move the atoms, that changes the effective coupling between the different electronic states of your system. And also this change in the electronic couplings change the potential energy surface where these things move and so on. And so, so you need to, to, to also be careful with taking that into account. And um, so, so this type of capturing these small energy scales that make a large difference in the system is a challenge for a theoretical simulation. But it's also an opportunity because if you can understand them quite a lot, you can also play with these smaller energy scales and maybe get interesting um, properties that you can tweak in your system. So I start by giving an overview of the methodology and how we try to, to, to simulate that in my group. So the, the motto of the group is that we want to do simulations that capture correlations between electrons and nuclei. And more than that, I also want to keep a quantum mechanical description for both electrons and nuclei at the same time reaching very large uh, uh, system sizes. So um, most of the, the simulations that I do uh, or that I did up to now are based on the born oppenheimer approximation where you have these, uh, the position of the nuclear the instantaneous position defining this external potential where you solve the electronic structure and the electronic structure gives the born oppenheimer potential where you solve the nuclear motion, for example. Um, and what I show here, um, I would like to just say which are the main challenges that we tackle in my group. 
uh, in order to, to describe the system. So for the nuclear part of the, of the problem, we, we target um, methods that are capable of taking into account inharmonic and quantum uh, coupling between these degrees of freedom. And we want to go beyond perturbative methods because as soon as you move away from these more canonical solid state systems, perturbative methods fail quite quickly. And that's where I want to apply this there. These developments are um, um, put into the IPy code, which is an open source community code has a user base of 100 or 200 users at the moment, and uh, uh, we do a lot of work there. And on the electronic system side of the problem, um, what we do as developments in my group is, is targeting methodology, especially in the realm of density functional theory, that can get better accuracy for large system sizes, and also that can get uh, response properties of the electronic uh, structure. And these implementations are then done in, in the FHA AIMS code, it's community-based, it's not open source, um, but talk to me if you want to get it. And, uh, and, and, uh, and I explain. And, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a user base is larger there, so 1,000 or 2,000 users at the moment. So of course, quantum mechanics is not the only, uh, the only theory that goes behind all the simulations that we do. Uh, statistical mechanics is an inherent part in a lot of properties that we have ca to calculate for the systems that plays a role both in the nuclear and electronic side and machine learning also uh, is, is now inherent to basically all simulations that we do, targeting, reducing the cost of the simulation that can get quite expensive, quite fast if you want to do quantum mechanics for both sides of the problem. Um, as you see in this talk, uh, the, the next frontier is relaxing a bit this Born-Penheimer approximation and letting both sides of the, of the problem uh, talk to each other more, more uh, directly. So, so here I'll give you two um, showcase examples where this methodology comes in handy. One is for uh, looking at nuclear quantum effects and reactions on metallic surfaces, and then doing a uh, spatially sensitive vibrational characterization of molecules on surfaces. So I decided to keep the, the talk here today on weakly bound system of molecules on surfaces to, to, to keep on time, otherwise I wouldn't. So I will give you, uh, before giving the applications, I'll also introduce the theory that we use behind that. So uh, for the electronic structure, as I mentioned before, it's a density functional theory that we use. Uh, and I believe most here have seen density functional theory many, many times uh, before. This is what I'm showing here is the Kohn-Sham energy functional. Rho here is my electronic density. And these are the, the, the several terms that we normally evaluate in, in Kohn-Sham uh, density functional theory. This last term here is the very famous exchange correlation uh, energy, which also defines exchange correlation potential. And this is really, I, I, I normally say, this is the, the term that we, we actually love because um, it, it is the term that really gives DFT all the successes that it has had so far, right? I mean, there are many good approximations for this term and they can be really successful in, in predicting a lot of properties of a lot of systems. However, it's, it's a kind of a love-hate relationship because uh, as many here know, I'm sure uh, it's not easy to systematically improve this approximation and you have to be very careful with what you put in, what you get out. Huh? So for this type of weak bound systems, for sure dispersion interactions are something that we are very worried about and we need to take into account. Uh, these we do within the, normally within this framework of many body uh, dispersion effects. Uh, also, specifically in the case of these interfaces, taking into account screening of these of these um, um, dispersion coefficients when you're close to metallic surfaces. Um, and then uh, for many of these weakly bound systems, not for the metal that I'll show here today, but for others, we would like to be able to use hybrid functionals because they do increase uh, the accuracy, but also they increase the cost of the simulations a lot. And this is recently in archive now that, uh, that we put out. This was a collaboration that was really led by the two first authors that you see here. Uh, and, and I was just helping in, in, in a very minor way, but the work is amazing. So I'm showcasing here. So this is, this is, um, this is the implementation of the hybrid functional uh, um, um, capabilities for periodic systems in the FHI AIMS code. This is the original implementation. This is gallium arsenide. This is how it used to, to scale with the number of cores. And this is the current new implementation for several different uh, sizes of, of the unit cell. So you see that now our scaling is a lot better. The improvements that were done here were 
algorithmical, we have a new layer of parallel parallelization in the code, and we have better data structures that, that we can parallelize over several cores. So what it means is basically that if I take one of those molecular crystals that I showed in the beginning of the talk, I can now treat very large system sizes, more than 15,000 atoms. We, we have in the publication 30,000 atoms um, in a time for a self-consistent field iteration that is, is, is still large, of course, but not, but not, not crazy. Yeah? So it, it's, really, it's really the difference between being able to do it in a reasonable time or not being able to do it at all. Um, and of course, you can imagine that if for these large systems, we can get that for much smaller systems, which are more common in many applications that we have, we can do it on a, on a, on a much better uh, way. So that opens the door to getting much more accurate data for many systems there and to train potentials for machine learning as well. But this is not enough because uh, you still would have to pay the price of doing many such self-consistent iterations in order to get your converged density, right? And this is a cost that is still too large for many applications that you want to do. So um, in the group, we worked on a, a machine learning um, method to directly predict the converged electronic density. And this was work from Alan Lewis, who, who was a postdoc in my group. Um, and what we wanted was to, what we did is the symmetry adapted learning of the, of the electronic density, which is based on a Gaussian process regression, the symmetry adapted Gaussian process regression, that starts with the density fitting on that of the of the um, of the electronic density, and then you build the symmetry adapted kernels, and then you train a Gaussian process regression model. And what we wanted to do is that uh, it would work for many material classes, for periodic and non-periodic systems on the same footing, and for you know metals, semiconductors, liquids, hybrid systems, and so on. So this uh, we implemented in connection with FHI aims. And what you can do then is that uh, once you train the model, you just need to give it the atomic representation. It will predict the density for you for any uh, material classes that you are interested in and that you have trained your model on. And then this density can be reconstructed inside the code and you can get properties out of that that are then very cheap to get. Um, just to showcase a few of the properties that we can do now, for example, we can look at um, several snapshots of liquid water and, and, and see how the, the, the homo-homo gap of these snapshots change. This is uh, an error plot, so how I predict in the reference. Note that we didn't train a model for that, right? We trained the model for the electronic density, <clears throat> but still we have a good prediction of the, of the gaps. We can also look at these twisted bilayer systems. Again, here I'm predicting the density training on very small unit cells, so only uh, three by three aligned unit cells. And I'm predicting the electronic structure and the band, the electronic bands of this large twisted bilayer structure. Uh, and you see the prediction versus the SF is very, very good. Um, you can play games of, of uh, refinement of low resolution X-ray data. This is also a collaboration that we have going on. And if you want to do a tutorial there, it's available here. And I believe the talk will be online later, so you can click. And this works also with PySCF, not only FHI aims. So you can also do that exercise there. So this is uh, for the electronic structure and how we get can get now uh, cheap electronic properties for large systems by training a model only on small systems, for example. Um, but we can go even further than that because um, we can use the same type of idea to learn an electronic response property. So for, ex for example, how um, your ele electronic density responds to an applied uh, electric field. And this is what we did here. So what we had to do is that we had to change a little bit how these descriptors that we put in our model work in order to be able to um, encode into it the, 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 the external perturbation field that we have there, but then, instead of doing you know, density functional perturbation theory in order to calculate Euler's abilities and dielectric properties of the system, I can simply give the atomic structure and you know, the model will spill out um, the, the electronic density response that I can read back in my code and calculate all of that in, in a single shot without, um, without paying the cost of converging density functional perturbation theory. So um, just to show the performance here, uh, I'm predicting only the density response from that, I'm reconstructing the, the, the polarizability or the susceptibility of this uh, naphthalene crystal cell. And then from that, I'm calculating a random spectrum. Okay? And then um, what you see there in, 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 
Red is the ground truth, it's a, the expansive simulation with density functional theory and density functional perturbation theory. And in blue, it is the, the prediction that you get from this model, which is, again, uh, quite good. So it's very successful there. But of course, I mean, if we're serious now about looking at Raman um, spectra, that is something I already showed in the beginning of the talk, um, getting the Raman cross sections, which is basically the intensity of these peaks is one part of the problem, but describing the nuclear motion that gives me the, like, let's say the X axis of that is the other side of the problem. And it's the question how good you do that and how well you can do that for this type of so on the other part of the problem then is how we grasp nuclear energy. <laughs> so um, uh, the, the, um, the most used approximation is this harmonic approximation, especially for solid state and crystals and so on. And that means that you get your born of potential and you expand it uh, around a certain minimum and then you truncate it on second order, right? So uh, if you have such an harmonic potential energy surface like I'm showing here, which is like a double double well potential, on two coordinates here, this is like approximating this potential energy surface around the minimum by this, by this, by this circle here. Uh, this is kind of okay if you're very close to the minimum, it becomes completely not okay if you go a bit further up. Uh, and then um, doing, it, doing it better beyond, but not staying on this perturbation of that in which you could, you know, like do more and more terms here, but going to full order, right? It means going to, uh, molecular dynamics uh, methods, right? So what we do here is that we do ab initio molecular dynamics and quantum uh, nuclear dynamics there. I think ab initio molecular dynamics, uh, many people have heard about, is just solving Newton's equations of motion with uh, uh, an ab initio born up in higher potential energy surface, but including nuclear quantum effects is a bit more difficult, let's say. The way we do that is uh, by, by, by using these imaginary time path integral based methods. So in this, in this type of uh, methods, what you have is a, is a, you can prove there's an isomorphism between a quantum system and the classical system. And the isomorphism works in, in, the, in calculating basically the thermodynamic properties of the systems in which you can prove that uh, the partition function of the quantum system here is equal to the partition function of this classical system that involves many replicas of your original system, the, the beads that go here. And each replica of the system is connected by harmonic spring. And this is encoded in this Hamiltonian that I sample here, this classical Hamiltonian that I sample here. And this equality is only equal, equal if, if the number of replicas, the number of beads there goes to infinity. But in practice, in a simulation, this is just a convergence parameter. So you need a certain amount of replicas of your system to kind of uh, converge your, your quantum uh, thermodynamical properties if you're trying to calculate it. In practice, we don't need a lot of replicas. There are many schemes also that uh, I, we have also worked on in my group uh, to reduce the number of replicas. But what is nice about it is, is not only that you can do uh, thermodynamical properties, but based on these methods, you can uh, pose ways of calculating quantum dynamical properties of the system, which then uh, gives you access to, to vibration spectra, reaction rates, and so on. And you see more of that in the talk. Um, this is important because this type of uh, methods, they allow you to include these nuclear quantum effects into high dimension and in, in harmonic systems, which is exactly where we want to, to go to. So the first method in that area I would like to talk about are these ring polymer instantons. And they are, um, what you do here is that you want to, to um, describe the tunneling event. So uh, if this is an energy barrier, I want to describe, um, you know, what is the probability, the, the tunneling rate to go here under the barrier, but not for a one dimensional barrier where I could use maybe the WKB approximation or something, but really for a multidimensional system. And, um, and you can do that in this path integral formalism that is called the ring polymer instanton. And then you end up with a, with a, a, a algorithm where you don't need to rely on dimensionality reductions. And this, this tunneling, this multidimensional tunneling path is, founding by, is found by optimizing a saddle point in a extended uh, phase space of this ring polymer that we showed in the slide before. So um, the, 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 the saddle point optimization gives you these positions here that I, that, that I denote by Q bar. You put that into the potential and this gives you the value that enters the action that you that you use here to, to calculate the rate. 
Um, so this is uh, this is nice, and we had a to start with. We had a very efficient implementation of this of this theory in the IPy code. Uh, the IPy code works by talking to electronic structure or machine learning codes in the background. It gathers uh, energies and forces from these codes, and with that, it performs all of these different optimizations with these ring polymers and so on. So this is all available there. Uh, if you want to try it out for your problem, we would be really happy to to uh, to to talk to you about it. So so talk to us. Um, and that we applied already in this in this. Um, it looking at this is uh, quantum mechanical effects into a reaction happening on the surface. This is work of uh, Yeri Littmann. He's a very talented uh, researcher who was a PhD student with me. Uh, and a lot of the things I'm showing today is his work uh, at the time. And now he's continuing great work. He's in Cambridge now as a postdoc. Um, and and what, the, the, what we were looking at here is, is this porphyrin molecule. So porphyrin is, um, is a toy system for a molecular switch. Yeah? So what you want to do is that you have so th some hydrogen atoms inside this porphyrin cage, and the tautomerization reaction of these hydrogen atoms gives you two states that if you control, you can realize a molecular switch. And this uh, has been studied by uh, skin tunneling microscopy. Um, very, very extensively, actually. So this is porphyrin on copper one on one uh, surface that we're studying. Uh, oh, sorry, one on zero surface that we're studying at first. And um, and what happens there is that um, the the rates of tautomerization had been uh, had been uh, measured, and they look like this. So this is the experimental data that was published many years ago now. And on, on, on silver one on zero, they look like this. So they have a slope and then they, they stop having the slope. And we were a bit puzzled because these, these temperatures here are very low. You see here on the top, the temperatures that they were measuring the STM on. And when you do a calculation, a simple uh, back of the envelope calculation, you can calculate the barrier for the tautomerization reactions. And from there, you can calculate something that is called the tunneling crossover temperature. This temperature is the temperature below which Suddenly, should play a dominant role in, in, the, in, the, in the reaction. So the, the experiments are always done way below this temperature. Even if theory is a bit wrong, it's usually not that wrong. So we, we measure, the, we, we think very close to room temperature here, and they were way below. But still, they, they have this Arrhenius type of slope here, and they only see this, this flattening at very, very low temperatures for, for silver. And, and this was very puzzling. So what's going on? Right? So, um, with these instanton techniques, which are very powerful, we could really look at this process in, in extreme detail. And what we found out is that indeed, so there, there is, um, uh, you can transfer these hydrogens inside the cage in a concerted way that both of them go to the other side or in a stepwise way, right? That one jumps and then the other jumps and you have this other cis structure here. And it turns out that if you have uh, an intermediate, even if it's short-lived and you can't really see an experiment, you will all, you will have a, a, a slope here on the rates, even if you're at the, the deep tunneling regime. And this happens because this intermediate is higher in energy than, than where you start from. And you need to overcome the energy difference between the zero point energy filling of these two wells in order to do the tunneling reaction. And this, this energy difference gives you a slope anyways in the tunneling rate, even if you're at the deep tunneling regime. However, it's a different slope than you would get from the classical barrier that would just look at the top of the barrier. So you can see here the actual calculation. So uh, there's a competition between the stepwise and the concerted mechanism. Uh, at higher temperatures, you have the stepwise mechanism winning, and then at some point at lower temperatures, the, the, the concerted mechanism will win. Uh, you can see there. There, um, you can you can see that things are tunneling by looking at the kinetic isotope effect. That is very different if you consider tunneling or not. Um, and, and and you can also see yes, we also predict this 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 Arrhenius type of slope there. Uh, so we have a comprehensive um, understanding of this reaction that you have the classical regime at very high temperatures. Then you have a change of slope in the Arrhenius plot, and you you have the tunneling of stepwise, and then you have this flat. Uh, slope when you the tunneling is completely concerted. Uh, and these uh, temperatures of uh, that you have the inflection here on the on the on the tunneling curves depends on the surface you're absorbed on because it 
depends, even though the molecule is weakly bound, it really depends on how strong this interaction between molecule and surface is back. And all of that you could get from the calculation. So, um, however, the surface, of course, I mean, it should be expected that it plays a role on the, on the mechanism of reactions at these different things, but that's the, not the only way in, that the surface played a role there. Uh, it also actually enhanced tunneling a lot. So this is the data here, the, the theory and the experiment that we had for uh, porphyrin and copper uh, 110, where we had a very good agreement with the DFT that we were doing. Um, and here we see that if we include the surface atoms into calcul the calculation of the tunneling path, the, this is what is shown here on the, on the side, the, the rates are actually um, very much, the tunneling rates are increased by up to three orders of magnitude at 75 feet. So the, the atoms of the surface actually plays a, play an active role on the tunneling path. Their degrees of freedom are there as well. And, uh, and this is a very important effect to take into account that can be done with the simulations that we do on full dimension. Okay, and then up to that point, this is all very nice. But I started to get a bit worried because we're calculating now these this rates of reactions on metallic surfaces. And, you know, I want to do even uh, more reactions there. And then you always get to this question, well, what about non-adiabatic effects? And one of the reasons that we worry more about non-adiabatic effects on metallic surfaces is that it has been known for a long time that it's, it, these low energy excitations that happen close to the Fermi energy of a metal can exchange energy with their nuclear motion very, very easily. So what happens is a bit of a cartoon here. What I have on the, on the left side is, is a, a band structure of a metal and the Fermi energy there. And there I have a metal moving. And as it moves, it creates these instantaneous uh, electron hole pairs that, um, that can exchange, can, can be a dissipative channel for the dynamics of your system. So um, this non-adiabatic coupling has been modeled uh, previously as a friction and fluctuation term in classical nuclear dynamics. But the question that we had at first is whether we could incorporate this electronic friction into nuclear tunneling. So uh, we went all the way. This is uh, again, uh, the, the later work that we did in my group together with Esther, um, who was also closed up there. And, um, what we did is extending this, uh, so, so this would be the, the potential energy of this ring polymer. This is the usual one that we take to calculate this instant on tunneling paths. And then now we can find how this potential energy surface is augmented by the presence of this effective friction term here in, in, the, um, in, in, the, in, the, in the tunneling, in the, tunneling uh, in the potential energy surface of the ring polymer. So the important thing that we did in the theory that was not done before is to uh, have, get an expression that can keep the spatial variation, the, uh, this is the, the, the nuclear coordinate here, Q, of this friction tensor that I have in the, in the, in the expressions. The friction tensor itself we calculate from uh, DFT normally. So this is uh, just the expressions given here, psi are my constant eigenstates. Q are, are my nuclear coordinates, so I have the derivatives of them with respect to nuclear coordinates. These are non adiabatic coupling terms, and these are the Fermi energies and the electronic eigen, eigenvalues. So, this, this is something that we have available from the DFT implementation. And then, if you have a good way of making your electronic structure code talk back to the nuclear code, then you can uh, do this, this, this optimization very nicely. Uh, it's a quite interesting picture that we have because in the usual ring polymer picture, what we have is the, only these nearest neighbor replicas talking to each other. But as soon as you get this friction term on, then you have no nearest neighbors uh, uh, interactions between the beads of your systems. And this changes how uh, nuclear motion, uh, nuclear quantum effects manifest in, in the picture. This is an example of how it can change. For example, uh, if I have this, uh, this is a potential energy surface based on the porphyrin uh, uh, problem of uh, hydrogen transfer. And uh, in black, here is a tunneling path if I didn't have any electronic friction. Uh, and then if I have this profile of electronic friction that has high friction on one side and low friction on another, as I increase the coupling to my system, the path starts to bend towards this, um, this, this uh, 
regions of low friction. So you have a different feathering path because of that. And the nice thing that this theory could give us is also that it could tell us more rigorously where we would expect strong attacks from friction on, 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 on hydrogen transfer rates and where we would not. Um, and this, we, we could then uh, connect to being higher barriers in this electronic state of molecular complex close to the Fermi energy of the man. Um, but what I find more interesting than that is that uh, by learning all of that, we also could think about connecting this to um, dynamical methods. And the reason for that is that in the end, uh, I would like to look at the reactions of, for example, uh, you know, where you have a hydrogen <laughs> splitting reaction of water, so with liquid and so on, where such theories like the instanton theory, which are effectively a transition state theory, cannot really work because I don't have just a single well-defined reaction coordinate and so on. So in order to do that, we go into this ring polymer molecular dynamics. Um, and there, what happens is that these are approximate methods. They can work quite well in certain regimes, especially in the condensed phase. And also they have several limitations. For example, they don't have any quantum coherence in their uh, in the nuclear wave packets. So they are good when these effects are not then for important level in your system. And what happens there is that you uh, take the dynamics in time of this ring polymer to, to mean something, and especially to calculate such type of um, time correlation functions. These time correlation functions can be used to calculate reaction rates. Um, the way we calculate it at the moment is uh, this bennett chandler product form. So I say that the, the rate of reaction, the quantum rate of reaction with uh, uh, ring polymer molecular dynamics it has this product, so the, the first term is what we call the quantum transition state theory term. It's a, a, a static term that depends on the quantum free energy that you have there. And then you have this dynamical uh, dynamical term, kappa of t here, which you have to, to, to take at this, uh, after it reaches this plateau time. Uh, and the game here is now that we, we, we can calculate this without including these electronic friction effects or trying to include them somehow. Um, and, and we are doing that at the moment. So I show uh, a couple of, of, uh, of um, results. So this is one, one system that we looked at. Okay, so this is hydrogen diffusing inside the palladium bulk. And what you see here in, in red is the potential energy surface of going from the octahedral to tetrahedral side. Uh, and in blue is the electronic friction projected along the, 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 the reaction coordinate. Uh, and what you see is that there, the, oops, sorry. you see that there's a um, a variation in space, yeah, that is almost an order of magnitude here from the transition state to the reactant or the product. So it's really important to take this spatial variation of the friction into account. So um, what we did at first, and this is um, this is actually an effort led by, by Yair that really uh, went after benchmarking this type of methodology now. Um, and, um, and now I'm just his collaborator. You see, this is a, a, a study that we should put in archive, I think very, very soon. And what we do there is that uh, we take a, a model system. So this is now a 1D a double well potential that is um, inspired by this hydrogen diffusing palladium with the electronic friction profile that is also inspired by that. So it's very low friction at the transition state and high friction at product in, 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 in the reactant state. And, and uh, what we can get there is that for these, these systems, you can pose a system bet uh, model problem and you can solve it exactly with uh, techniques like multi-configuration time-dependent heart tree. We're collaborating with Bronco Martinazzo there that is a guru of these uh, simulations. And what you see here is the logarithmic logarithm of the rate with respect to the friction strength. And in red, sorry, in green, you see the, the exact results. In blue, you see the classical results, so it's the result of the rate you would get if your nuclei were classical particles in this case. And in red, you see the RPMG results. So the first thing is that the RPMG results really uh, describe very well these different regimes. This is at room temperature, by the way. And uh, the classical results are different. And uh, the reason why, you know, after a certain strength of friction, this continues going up and the classical one doesn't is very interesting. Please ask me if you want to know about it after the talk because it's too many details otherwise. And, but, but it's a real quantum effect, yeah? 
And in order to apply this to higher dimensional systems so that you don't stay only on this 1D model systems, we want to go into this, uh, you know, what I was doing there, I was um, approximating the electronic degrees of freedom by a best of harmonic oscillators, basically quantum harmonic oscillators. Uh, but now I want to have this, what we call the implicit path in which I can just describe the effect of the path on my system by a friction kernel, a friction. Uh, uh, coefficient or, or kernel in this case. So this is this then takes you to these generalized Langevin dynamics that you need to solve for the system, and you need to solve the dynamics in order to calculate this rate again. The way we are doing it is is um, work led by another postdoc in my group, George Trenins, who is looking at ways of solving this issue by working with this auxiliary variable representation of generalized Langevin equations. This has been used before, for example, in the context of the scored noise thermostats. And the question here is how to fit the type of uh, friction kernel that we have in, in this type of problems of electronic friction, and also how to propagate the equations of motion that the propagators are a bit tricky. But George has done a great, uh, great progress already there. So you can look at how you get the this static part, and what you see here is the implicit path in black and the explicit one in 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 in, in orange. And you see that they agree as they should, but we need uh, an order of magnitude less uh, force poles to do the implicit one, which is really what we're looking for. And also for the transition coefficient, the the thing depending on time there. These are the number of bath modes I needed to discretize the spectral function that I had of the bath. So I needed at least 64, 128 to, to, to um, converge these while uh, with these auxiliary variables, I only need two and I'm converged. So this is, I think, looking very promising and George is writing up this part of the, of the problem right now. And with that, I hope that we can uh, go to uh, more interesting systems. I will not show this here today, but specifically I'm hoping to, to really, sorry, to really apply it to, to these uh, water splitting reactions, which is somewhere we have some evidence that they should play an important role. So then this takes me to the last part of my talk in the last uh, 10 minutes or so, or even less, that, we, that has to do with the following. So it's very nice that now I can simulate all of these reactions and so on, but um, could there be a way that I can actually look and connect more closely to experiment with these, let, let's say, single molecule reactions or single molecule properties of um, vibrational motion, right, on, on surfaces. And this is uh, where we come to tip-enhanced Raman spectroscopy. So uh, tip-enhanced Raman spectroscopy is a very interesting technique that has appeared in the last decades in which uh, you, you overcome the, the the spatial resolution that you would have. So the spatial resolution of usual Raman spectroscopy is limited by the diffraction limit. And if you want to look at single molecule properties, you need to go be, beyond that and you, you need sub-nanometer resolution. So what happens here is that you come with a far electromagnetic field that, uh, that um, excites a, a plasmon here in, on an STM tip. And this, uh, and this resonance creates then a, a local field that massively enhances the Raman scattering at the position where the local field is. So you, you get a signal that is quite localized in space and it can reach a very good resolution and then you do Raman spectroscopy like that. This is uh, one of the original publications that they did for molecules on surfaces from, from the Karen group. Uh, and you can see here that this is the Raman spectrum, the, the tip enhanced Raman spectrum that they get for this molecule with super. So this is experimental data. Uh, with very high resolution for a certain vibrational mode. Uh, so our question was, how can we simulate that? Because um, simulation methods that were around were quite expensive, um, es especially in terms of taking into account the fact that these molecules are on surfaces. And I already know from many, from a lot of work in my group that normally the surface can play a larger role than you think, even if the molecule is or weakly bound to the surface. So the idea that we had was to get a method that can still take into account the surface, yeah? And the way we did it is that we joined the uh, time dependent functional theory for the response of the, the tip. So we, we calculate for, for a certain tip geometry, 
we calculate what is the local field created by, by, by an external uh, time dependent uh, um, perturbation. Uh, and then we do that only once. And we put this uh, local field perturbation that we calculated for a certain tip geometry into a density functional perturbation theory type of uh, calculation. So um, you will see that next. So that this is the local field that has a realistic distribution. And from that, we can calculate the random spectrum. Uh, so what happens is that my Hamiltonian now is the, the Hamiltonian that I had before, the most perturbed one. Then there's a ground state contribution from the tip um, Hartree potential, essentially. And then you have a perturbation that is the external homogeneous field and the perturbation that is coming from the, from the local field. And that's what you use to solve density functional perturbation theory, mm -hmm. essentially. Uh, with that, you can, can get a local polarizability tensor, and then you can get a local Raman intensity. Uh, for example, in the harmonic approximation, you just calculate the derivative of that with respect to some uh, vibrational mode. So what that, this method is very efficient, actually. So what it allowed us to do is to look at, for example, to see an E on, on, on silver 100. And what we do is that we come with the tip and we scan it like that. Uh, that's my, my computational tip in this case. That's this local field moving around. And I can calculate the Raman intensity at each position. And then I can create figures like this. And this is what I get with only the molecule or the molecule on the surface for the same vibrational mode. Uh, so this is a very different image, right? So the polarization of the surface actually plays a strong role on the type of images that we get. Uh, and I think this is, uh, I think the first method that uh, could do that, at least as far as I, I know, with a realistic, you know, with a full atomistic description and also everything coming from ad initial calculations in this case. Of course, it would be nice to then do the machine learning that I showed in the beginning here to make this even cheaper. And I, I think we should do that in the future. But um, this is now the, the end of the talk. And I would like to, to show some more recent results because uh, I'm working with some collaborators that are also doing this tip enhanced Raman spectroscopy on uh, even simpler systems but that can be quite, quite interesting. So this is just hydrogen molecules at the junction of a silver tip with a silver one-on-one surface. Um, and this year, what I show here on the side is, is, is uh, my calculation. So this is an enharmonic uh, tip-enhanced Raman spectrum that I get from my theory here. So it's calculated from the Fourier transform of these uh, polarizability tensor derivatives uh, that I take from, from, from simulations. Um, what is nice here is that because you have this local resolution of the tip, it's really, uh, uh, the spectrum is really coming from the molecule or only almost from the molecule directly below the tip. So it's very sensitive to that. And I mean, it's, it's quite simple, right? I mean, there's one stretch peak and one rotational peak as you would expect. Um, the stretch peak we get in a nice position. The rotational peak is not so nice from the simulations because you would expect this J equal to the J equal zero transition of para hydrogen. We don't have nuclear spin in the simulations, but in qualitatively it's, it's, it's. Now what is interesting, and this is unpublished data that my collaborators were kind enough to let me show. It's, it's hopefully uh, very soon out. So that's why they let me show also. And so this is from Akitoshi uh, Shiotari and Takashi Kumagai. Um, and this is here, um, their, their, their tip enhanced Raman spectrum that they take as they approach the tip to the surface or, or take it out. So in, in the, in the y-axis here is, is you're approaching the tip to the surface. On the, on the top row, you have hydrogen molecules. On the bottom row, you have deuterium molecules. And here you have the rotational peak and here you have the vibrational peak. So summarizing what they see that is uh, quite interesting is that the rotational peak is, does not shift as you uh, change this distance. While the vibrational peak chain has a strong redshift for hydrogen, a very, 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 very small redshift for the two. So this was a bit puzzling because, you know, if the rotational shift is not changing, and this took me some time to, to figure out, it means that you're not changing too much the, or you're not changing at all the strength of the hydrogen hydrogen or the two deuterium bond. Because if you would change that, the rotational peak would change, the rigid rotor, it would change. Yeah? So this is not the reason why you have a red shift of the vibration. It's not a weakening of the hydrogen-hydrogen bond or something like that. 
it has to be something else. And also it has to be quite quantum because the effect for hydrogen is completely different than from deuterium and cannot be ex explained by just a mass scaling uh, type of um, uh, idea. So, um, so what happens there is that uh, I could calculate the potential energy surfaces of the molecule surface tip interaction. So I'm bearing this D uh, value here, which is the hydrogen molecule just below the tip going up and down for several tip positions. And that you see already here that it goes from a kind of a double well potential to a kind of Morse potential as you, as you increase the, the surface. So now if you look at zero point energy, so what would be the, the, the you know, lowest energy vibrational level of hydrogen and, and deuterium, these potentials, uh, this is what you get here. Yeah, so I can solve this in a second. And I can also calculate the, the position of these molecules in this well, right? And it, they are different because the, 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 the wave functions are different. So hydrogen is, 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 you know, it stays farther away from the surface than deuterium, right? And I can play that game for the several different potentials that I get with different tip distances. And then I can look at vibrational coupling because the fact is that this uh, up and down uh, hydrogen molecule uh, movement is coupled to the uh, um, hydrogen stretch mode. And I can see how it's coupled. I can actually calculate the, the hydrogen stretch at several positions of this molecule here in the tip, uh, in the tip surface junction for several tip distances. And this is what you, you see here in the several colored lines. And then I can also map the equilibrium distance of hydrogen and of deuterium in this, in this uh, diagram. And yes, and you get that. I mean, so you get that the, the, the shift for hydrogen is almost in the calculation three times more than the shift for deuterium, which is uh, um, quite a lot more than, than, than you know, a mass scaling would give you. And this is an interplay between vibrational coupling and neutral quantum effects that this type of uh, spectroscopy is quite sensitive to, that we were not actually expecting that. So, and it's really because it's sensitive to this uh, hydrogen molecule right below the tip. So you can look at several uh, details of that in the simulation. So that takes me to the end of the talk. So um, I think one take home message is that it's surface dynamics are just the, the fact that the surface is there really matters. Even if you have weakly balanced systems, don't forget about the surface. Molecules and surfaces are, are, are two things. Um, and that quantum mechanics for electrons and nuclei are reaching larger and longer scales. I even didn't talk about it, but of course, machine learning for this nuclear motion is a big thing that we're also doing in, in the group. And I think the nice thing would be that we could try to exploit competing energy scales in the systems of the weakly bound systems, molecules on these traditional solids that I've shown here, or on 2D materials, which is what I want to do next, for several different technological applications. I want to say that this methodology is, is, is you know, I, I showed it for molecules and surfaces, but they are really powerful general types of methodology. So you can do the same type of quantum molecular dynamics if you get have good potentials. For example, to look at the melting of a charge density wave on, on tantalum disulfide. This is the heat capacity that we calculate from the simulations. We get finite size effects figured out because for this there was a good potential. And this was something that I did with the group of Tim Belling in the University of Hamburg. And um, yes, and exploiting this uh, non-equilibrium and non-adiabatic regimes that we can drive systems and also have this non-adiabatic effect uh, with this methodology that we can have can really make it make a difference, I think, for the simulation of these hybrid materials where you have molecular and, and 2D solid state at the same time. So thank you for your attention and let me thank the group that worked quite a lot beyond the people that I already talked about in the talk and thank you for your attention. <laughs>